Defying the threat of execution, they're still demonstrating on the streets of Iran. Women in Iran set their headscarves on fire in fury. Iran International said security advice from UK police prompted it to close its UK broadcast center and has moved its operations to Washington. break me, but I am here to break them. I am here to break them. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on this panel, Iran's War on Journalists. My name is Yalda Hakim. I will be your moderator for the next 20 minutes or so. I'm a BBC journalist and I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be here with two colleagues, uh, journalists, Masi, who's an activist and was driven out of Iran, uh, and she remains a, a thorn in the side of the Iranian regime. And two people whose work I respect and admire, but also two people I consider friends. So thank you so much uh, for joining me here on this panel. And of course, Paul, you work for Tortoise Media. You're an investigative journalist. And you've just uh, launched the second series uh, of your podcast, London Grad. We will be talking a lot about that. But Masi John, I mean, it's quite extraordinary when you think about this video that we've just seen, seven months since those demonstrations began. And I initially wanted to ask you what it's been like for the women of Iran, for those who are demonstrating outside of Iran, pushing for change inside the country over the last seven months. But actually, it's been 43 years of challenges and difficulties. First of all, I have to say that when I saw the photo of Mahsa Amini, um, my heart was like, I could hear my heart beating faster. So because that woman was only 22 year old when she got killed in the hand of morality police. And I remember that eight years ago when Tina Brown invited me at Women in the World Summit to talk about compulsory veiling, people didn't take that serious. So I remember that I said, uh, next revolution will be led by women. People are so mass is exaggerating because he, she wants to promote her campaign. That was not it. You understand the pain. It has been 40 years. Women are being like second class citizens in Iran. Women are being told that you cannot ride a bicycle. You cannot go to a stadium. You cannot sing. You cannot get a passport. You cannot travel without getting permission from your husband. Women are being kicked out from everywhere. So finally, the brutal death of Mahsa Amini created a huge anger. And actually, to me and millions of Iranian women, this is called a revolution, and this is the beginning of the end. Maybe the street protest is calmed down, but believe me, women of Iran, they're not going to give up. They will end this gender apartheid regime alongside men in Iran. And the thing is, the regime in Iran hasn't just attempted to silence Iranian women inside the country. Even here today, there are four metropolitan police officers here to protect you. Were you allowed to mention that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I like, like, I like journalists like you. I love badass women because, to be honest, um, I was shocked because, you know, British people are more relaxed when it comes to death threats. But when I see now four metropolitan police around me, 
I'm not relaxed anymore. <laughs> because it, it shows you actually the level of threats as a, you mentioned Yalda is very tense and high even on the UK soil. Yes, after my appearance uh, on Piers Morgan's show last night, uh, the team from Metropolitan Police came to my hotel and they said that everywhere you go, we have to protect you. What does it mean? They're all actually using the resource of the UK people to protect me. But I am here to ask the UK government to protect democracy. Because right now, journalists are under threats. Iran international journalists, biggest TV here in London, thanks to actually uh, London for making uh, here, uh, allowing us to have a platform to express ourselves. But the Islamic Republic actually sent killers here. One of them, you can talk about it because I know that you interviewed them. One of them had the, was on court. As uh, I said, I myself being the target of kidnapping plot, assassination plot, we are not scared of our lives at all because people inside Iran sacrificing their life. They're facing guns and bullets and executions. But what is scary? That the UK government, the US government, the Western countries, they are allowing the terrorist regime to challenge them on Western soil. This is scary. And I uh, want to meet with the members of parliament here and tell them that how come you ask Iran International TV to stop their work because of the threats from Iranian regime? Instead of canceling journalists, you have to cancel the terrorist regime of Iran. There are a number of journalists from Iran International here today as well. And, and Paul, this is an issue that you have been covering. I couldn't put down your first, well, I couldn't stop listening to your first podcast, London Grad. It was about Russia's influence here in London. But the second one, uh, which you launched a couple of weeks ago, is focused on the Iranian regime's attempt to silence journalists here in, in the UK and in particular London. That's right. So it, it, in many ways, the theme is the same, that... London was once, you know, a haven, a good place to be with Russia for oligarchs and their money. For a lot of Iranians, it was a place where they could do the journalism they couldn't do back home. So London is home to three TV channels that broadcast in Persian by free-to-air satellite for the Iranian diaspora, but also Iranians back home. And they always, you know, their lives were always very difficult. But ever since the Masa Amini protests, their lives became harder. Why? Because they started reporting on the, those protests quite fearlessly, quite relentlessly, and came to be seen by the Iranian government as, as a threat to them. And the situation became bizarre in that the UK always handled Iran in what appears to be a quite soft way, but suddenly, you know, since last year, Iran was, began actively trying to kill and kidnap people here. And so the, the calculations started changing. You know, the, the, the issue of Iran stopped being simply a, a, a foreign affairs issue and became a, a very real, very Im immediate domestic one. And actually, um, one of my colleagues, Rana Rahimpour, yes, uh, right. featured in your, and she interviewed Masa Amini's um, father. Let's just have a little listen and then yes. we can talk around that. A coroner's report had been published a few hours earlier in which they claimed that her death had nothing to do with being beaten up in the custody of the morality police. He denied it. He said, my daughter was very healthy. And then he said he wasn't even able to see Masa's body um, and when he begged, he was allowed to see her feet, which were swollen, and her face. And it was obvious that she had um, experienced um, trauma to her head. I said, Mr. Armini, what do you think really happened? And the line cut off. And then my editor said, he's on the line again. And I said, OK, it sounds like we have Mr. Armini on the line again. And Mr. Armini... What do you think really happened? And as he began to say his sentence, the line dropped. They cut him off and we never managed to get him again. Yeah, I mean, I, a completely heartbreaking interview, you know, and there was something I thought especially cruel about the way his line kept cutting off. You know, this poor father was desperate 
to say, no, my daughter didn't die of natural causes, but they kept cutting him off. So the, so the journalist, Rana Rahimpur, in a way is the story in a grain of sand because she, um, she left Tehran when she was 25. She used to work for Press TV, so the state news service, to take up what she called her dream job at BBC Persian. And her father told her, you know, go, take your dream job. I know what it means to you, but never come back. As long as these people are in power, never come back. Because she's been reporting on, um, on the Amini protests and on Iran more broadly, her life became, professionally as a journalist, unbelievably difficult. So you'll, you'll hear in the podcast how she also has counterterrorism police officers checking on her, um, one of whom advised her to warn her school to be um, very cautious about emails that appear to come from her because they told her Iranian operatives may spoof your email address, rearrange your children's pickup time and kidnap them, right? This is a school in, in London. Um, and Hrana has now, has now left BBC Persian, right? And the police told her your life may now get a little bit easier. And I, I, I mean, I, I know, um, Masih John, you're shaking your head, but I... I mean, I'm, I'm shaking my head because I never leave my job. This is what the Iranian government wants us to do. Two journalists who covered the story of um, Mahsa Amini, um, Elohe Mohammadi and uh, Nilufar Hamadi are in prison right now. And that is why citizen journalists in Iran, they're doing our job. And uh, citizen journalists like Fereshta Ahmadi and Ghazale Chalabi, both of them got shot while they were filming the protesters. So that actually shows you that the Islamic Republic is scared of truth. Mm. They are the biggest enemy of truth, and uh, they're trying to stop us. We should not give up our fight. I mean, of course this is scary, but miles away from Iran, we are here. The word safe is too luxury, as you mentioned, London, New York is not heaven anymore as far as the Islamic Republic is power. Well, you know, the New York Times described you as the woman uh, whose hair frightens Iran. I mean, <laughs> I'll never forget that, that image of the hitman looking through the, your, the hole in your door to see if anyone was home, and he had an AK-47 with him. They also tried to smuggle you and kidnap you, take you to Venezuela. Yalda, let me be very, very honest with you. It is scary to see a man with AK-47 in front of my house. But at the end of the day, they are scared of me. They are scared of millions of Iranian women like me. Why they kill teenagers? Why they target the schoolgirls by chemical attacks? Because the mullahs, with guns and bullets, with power, with money, with everything, they are scared of us. Our voice, our words, our camera are more powerful than their weapon. But what we need here we have to actually get the, the, the Western countries that we're not going to win this battle on our own. Sooner or later, of course, we will get rid of these dictators, but by hesitating to designate the Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization, believe me, uh, more people are going to get killed. And it's not just us journalists from Iran or Middle East. The Revolutionary Guards, the Islamic Republic, is helping Putin to kill innocent Ukrainians. The Islamic Republic is a threat to people in the region. They are threats to democracy here. And that is why I uh, want to repeat myself. I'm not scared of my life. If they're going to kill me and it's going to make awareness, come and kill me. I'm ready. But this is scary that in front of free world, in front of the eyes of free media, that women are getting killed, journalists are getting killed, men are getting hanged and executed for telling the truth. You know, uh, in the green room just now, uh, Masi was saying to, she said to her 26-year-old son that if anything happens to me, you've got to carry this fight on, which is something, Paul, you've continued to do for your mother. Yes. I, yeah, I may have advice for your son. But um, so there it is. Oh, oh. It's, yeah, I, I don't think I'll ever get used to the family album <laughs> being projected. <laughs> um, but uh, so that is... That is my family, my father in the background being what we call 
an active parent. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, my, two, my two older brothers and my mother holding me. So my, so my mother, Daphne, um, was murdered in a car bombing in October 2017. Um, I wasn't working at, as a journalist at the time. Um, I was doing something completely different, actually. Uh, but for the first few months after her murder, we, my brothers and I weren't really working. We were campaigning a lot, traveling around the world, um, until it got to a point where I really did have to return to work and toward journalism is, is the one thing that felt. But she was a, you know, a, an investigative journalist in Malta. Yes. Who was a thorn in the side of, of the government there. Yes, which sort of explains my attraction to really horrible stories. The, <laughs> there is a really direct line, actually, from my mother's case to this Iran story. So on one of these campaigning trips, my brothers and I met a really great lawyer called Keelan Gallagher, KC, who acts for BBC Persian. And she told me, look, they've always had a hard time, but now it's getting really bad. You know, the security briefings, the police officers everywhere. And I, that struck me as really extraordinary for the reasons we mentioned. And I just started reporting it out. And so I spoke to Rana and her colleagues. I w went to Iran International before it was shut. And it, it really just grew from there. And there's also a direct line to Masih's case as well. So the, the man, or the men who... The men. <laughs> yes. The three, the three gunmen. Um, the Department of, US Department of Justice revealed um, our members of a organized crime group called Thieves and Law, so which has its roots in Russia, but has spread across former Soviet states. Iran International um, was subject to a surveillance operation not long ago where an Austrian man of Chechen origin was caught um, collecting, as the law says, information that may be useful for an act of terrorism. Anyway, in the reporting we found he's, you know, he's almost certainly linked to thieves in law as well, which is another striking thing about Iran that it subcontracts in this way, unlike, say, Russia with the GRU or whatever, which makes it all the more frightening because these people are everywhere, right? It doesn't have to send people. They're already there. That's, That's you. you. <laughs> that is With you. Macron. <laughs> Um, you've been campaigning a lot, Massey, over not just the last six or seven months, for several years, really since you were pushed out of the country uh, over a decade ago. But can you just give us a sense of where the protests are at now? Because we are hearing about executions, we're hearing about arrests, but not the demonstrations. I mean, no, I don't accept that because women are still in the streets and um, removing their hijab, for some of you, if you don't know, in 21st century, walking unveiled is a punishable crime in Iran. So you get lashes for that. You get kicked out and they're using um, cameras from China to actually identify women in subway, in metros, and arrest them. So clearly, I have to say that women are still resisting, and why the men got executed for the crime of supporting their sisters. The 50 innocent protesters are in the death row. So the level of the brutality is very, very tense, and I believe that, yes, the street is a little bit calmed down, but people are preparing themselves to uh, come back to the street, and I believe that the next wave will be much heavier. But the thing is, when the Iranian regime don't, as you said, yes, I've been campaigning. I met with President Macron. I met with Prime Minister Rutte, the Prime Minister of Netherlands. I met with the leaders of many democratic countries. But to be honest, empty words, empty condemnations never stop people, uh, stop Iranian regime to kill innocent people, you know? Yeah, I, I was really mad and angry when I saw that President Macron shake the hand of uh, Ibrahim Raisi right after the massacre happened in Iran. I complained about that, and he said that France is all about diplomacy. But I said, no, France is also about a revolution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. And, and the West is also about democracy. It's about equality. It's about feminism. 
children, women are getting killed, but it's still we see that the democratic countries are trying to get back to the negotiation table. What we need here, we cannot just ask people to go to the street, get killed, get executed. Okay, we are here, we're gonna give you a voice. No, we need concrete actions. When teenagers are getting killed, the leaders of democratic countries who say we are all about feminism and equality, they have to isolate the gender apartheid regime. Women of Afghanistan being fade out from the news. My heart is broken. Imagine it was not women of Afghanistan. Imagine it was women in the UK. If you get kicked out from a school, what would the rest of the world do? If women get kicked out from a stadium, if school girls are the target of chemical attacks, what would you do? So then what is different between women of Iran, women of Afghanistan, and women in the UK? That is why I, I believe that women in Iran and Afghanistan, they are still protesting, but they are watching us. They are watching the rest of the world. The time has come that we have to stick with women of Iran and Afghanistan. If not, believe me, we are going to face Taliban and Islamic Republic and UK soil. Please stop, don't stop protecting me. The <laughs> <laughs> I still need you, but... The UK government, they have an important rule. They have to take the lead. I'm here to meet with the members of parliament, but I believe that the Western democratic countries, instead of meeting with murderers regime of Iran, they have to recognize the civil disobedience and they have to recognize the revolution and meet with uh, the opposition. I, uh, this week, spoke to a protester inside Iran who described to me what it was like walking out of the house without her headscarf. She said, wearing, I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt. I mean, to us, it feels like nothing, but for them, they're risking their lives every time they do this. Singing, dancing, these sorts of things. Singing, I mean, can you believe that? Singing, I mean, I get very angry. Singing solo can get you jailed. Will you be their voice today for I them? always, I mean, I always uh, sing for them. I mean, I'm not a good singer, but there is a famous uh, sing, song in Iran actually says that I blossom through my wounds. There are so many girls, I'm sure that you saw their pictures. They're being blinded. But they say that you can take our eyes, you can take our lives, you can take our bodies, but not our hope. We are here to end the gender apartheid regime. And the song is, you know that. It means I'm a woman, I'm a woman. That is amazing. <laughs> I didn't translate it. You have to translate that. Zanam, zanam. I'm a woman, I'm a woman. I'm and a I woman. blossom through my wounds. This is the nature of women in Iran and Afghanistan. Be with us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Nasim Khor. <laughs>